As a criminal psychologist, I know that this pattern of behaviour, the map of crime, recurs again and again. It struck me clearly first in the mid-1980s, when I was asked to help solve a series of very nasty rapes around the west of London, by one, and sometimes two men, who finally killed. They were called the railway rapists because all the assaults took place close to railway lines, but they were tied in to three murders that took place on the opposite sides of London, although they had very similar features. One of the worst crimes involved a 15-year-old Dutch girl, Marty Tamboza, who they attacked near this station in Surrey as she cycled through woodland. They dragged her for half a mile through the woods before raping and killing her. The investigation at the time suggested an unknown man had been staking out the area for some days looking for a vulnerable victim. The police asked for help to stop the man killing again and assigned a detective constable, Rupert Heritage, to work with me. For the first time in 15 years, he's retracing the struggle for life of Marty's last moments. You're just um, coming up to the point all those years ago where, yeah. at this point, those railings were then upright, but yeah. between the railings and the fence had been stretched a, a length of monofilament, similar to um, strimmer cord. Yeah. Not sufficiently strong to stop anybody who was determined to get through it, but f as, a, as a confrontation point to a young female, um, as good as any, it's going to cause them to stop. And once they're stopped, then you've got the confrontation point. So you think they probably seized her here? Somewhere? I think so, yeah. And then... And then Took it on and then over. took it on over across the field. The sort of next reference point from the from the pickup side, yeah. you know, from the abduction side, was the discovery of her bike along that tree line. Now it's 15 years on now, so whether I can actually pick up where the bike was, I don't know. But if we aim for about a midpoint, that's where you could say the bike had been left. Um, in the tree line, not invisible, but within the tree line. The bike was against the fence. And the next scene, further on, we pick up the bridle. They've, they've take, taken her a long way, haven't they? Absolutely. They must have had some idea where they were going. During the examination of who was moving around the scene, um, we were left with about 27 sightings of, of an unidentified male, somebody, some male person within the uh, area of the villages that we could never actually get rid of. We couldn't um, say of what, by any means that that was a particular person. Yeah. So, um, again, that gives you no indication at the time that you're yeah. looking for anybody. So it was somewhere over here that the yeah. body was found? In the, in, somewhere in the woods that, that run off to my right here yeah. and amongst the quite heavy leaf ball. There were three murders at that stage and I remember there were at one stage, up to something like 27 rapes. <coughs> there were, when we started that analysis, there were two murders, and I think we, in total, we had about 40 uh, rape and sexual assault cases. But the focus in those days was really on the sexual assault cases yes, because that was more material That's we could right, work yeah. with, uh, greater descriptions and so on. And it was from that that we went on to build the map, if you remember, that you're suggesting that we built it in years rather than as a global picture. I knew we had to look beyond the wood where Marty was found to examine all the crime locations. It was clear that this was a person on a vicious journey, starting with unplanned, opportunistic rape and leading to planned, brutal murder. What if we could see this way of thinking in his journeys to his crimes? This would mean that his early attacks grew out of his daily activities, the areas he knew best. I asked Detective Constable Heritage to make a map showing the progress of the crimes. This revealed a startling pattern, moving outwards like a disease. It was only later that he moved further afield as he became more confident, 
The early rapes marked a vicious territory around North London, West Hampstead and Kilburn. It seemed obvious that the killer must have been living near to that hub of criminal activity. Only one of the many police suspects lived in this area. Close surveillance of him produced the evidence that the police needed. This was where the geographical profile pointed, and this is where one John Duffy had a flat. In 1987, Duffy was convicted of two murders and five rapes. A decade later, he turned in his accomplice, David Mulcahy. They're both serving life.